In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Who's in? Who's out? Since the beginning of time, Cain and Abel fought over which of them was God's favor. Lines have been drawn. Walls built. Barriers erected. Caps and classes divide. To separate who's in from who's out. In his three short years of ministry, Jesus began breaking down these walls. Walls between men and women. Gentile and Jew. Samaritan and Jew. Rich and poor. And Jesus' followers continued breaking down the barriers people loved to erect, trying to make themselves seem more, more important. Well, after the resurrection and Pentecost, when the church was born, Jesus' followers began preaching the good news. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, describes primarily the missionary work of Peter and Paul. We don't hear much about the other disciples. For example, Thomas, who went all the way to India. And the church that Thomas started in India is still in existence today. But Luke does make brief mention of Philip. Philip first went to Samaria and began breaking down the wall. The Samaritans were descendants of the northern kingdom. And there was bad blood between them and the Jews, the descendants of the southern kingdom, or Judah. And in Jesus' day, the Jews were in, the Samaritans were out. But the church broke down the barrier. Jesus and Philip included the Samaritans, and the Samaritans were now in. Then Philip found himself on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, where he came upon a black African sitting in a chariot, at a rest area, no doubt, reading the Hebrew Scriptures. And the, the Spirit said to, Pete, to Philip, go on over and talk to him. Philip found out that he was an official from the Queen of Ethiopia's court, and a, and a deeply religious man. Even though he was not a Jew, he went to Jerusalem at every opportunity so he could worship in the temple. And he was a highly educated man. He was reading the Hebrew scriptures. Well, he asked Philip to instruct him. And Philip took advantage of the opportunity to go through the scripture and show how it pointed to Jesus. And the man rejoiced in the good news and asked to be baptized. Now, what is amazing about this incident, amazing, is the wall that Philip broke down. Certainly a black African was not a common sight in the temple in Jerusalem. But now Africans were not out, they are in. They're in the body of Christ, thanks to Philip. Not only, however, was the man an African, he was a eunuch. And the eunuch was a man who had been castrated a horribly cruel act so that he would not be a sexual threat to the queen. Society did not think much of eunuchs in those days, considered them to be less than men. They were not allowed to sit uh, in the temple with men, with real men in the sacred space. They had to sit with the women and the children. Again, Philip takes one who is out and brings him in. The kingdom of God is for everyone. No one is out unless he or she chooses to be out. No one is out just because of their sexual orientation or their national origin or their economic condition or their color. Oh, what a week we've had celebrating the best of our America this past week. It was a historic occasion for Tiger Woods to win the Masters Golf Tournament and to break uh, several records as well. And as the first African American to win a major golf tournament, he was following in the footsteps of 
Jackie Robinson. Wasn't that a coincidence? In the same week, 50 years before, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier to become the first black man to play Major League Baseball. Well, we moved from Minnesota to California in 1969, where I was appointed associate pastor at First Church Palo Alto, which is in Stanford country. And when Stanford won the Rose Bowl in 1971, our family got all excited. So the next year, we bought the family plan tickets, which allowed us to sit in the end zone. And along with the city and the campus, how excited we were when Stanford again went to the Rose Bowl. Well, I had a wedding on Sunday afternoon, the day after Christmas. And the groom, because it was Christmas, gave me an honorarium of $100. Now, $100 went a lot further in those days. So I went home and shouted to the family, let's go to the Rose Bowl game. I'm always ready for an adventure. That's how I got to Merced. <laughs> and of course, everyone in the family wanted to go. The boys were ages 10 and 8 and 2 and 4. 10, 8, and 4 at that time. Well, there were two problems. Tickets and how to get back for church on Sunday because New Year's Day was Saturday that year. If that was easy, I would drive on Saturday night. Actually, we both drove while I slept on the hump in the back seat, on the, on the floor in the back seat, in 10-minute intervals as we crawled through the heavy Central Valley fog on Highway 99. You know about that fog. This was before I-5 was constructed. Problem solved. Next problem was tickets. Well, seasoned ticket holders, even family plan people, were allowed uh, to uh, buy, purchase two Rose Bowl tickets. So then we began to search through the newspaper ads to see if anyone was selling tickets. Hurrah! We found one, which we quickly purchased. Now we had three tickets, five people. But mother and aren't most mothers martyrs? made the supreme sacrifice and said, you three boys go to the, the game, and Craig and I will stay outside and entertain ourselves. So away we went. <laughs> As it was our first time to drive to Southern California, I wanted to go down Highway 101 so we could see the ocean. Have you ever, can you imagine what it's like to see Santa Barbara for the first time, Minnesotans from flat country. We were so engrossed in the scenery and ooing and awing about the ocean on one side and the mountains on the other. I never saw a policeman <laughs> until he pulled us over. Even though he sympathized with my eloquent explanation, he still gave me a speeding ticket. Well, there went $25 of my $100 honorarium. But we didn't care. We were going to the Rose Bowl. Well, we made our way to the Pasadena area and found a, a motel, set the alarm for an early time so we could get to Pasadena for the parade. But it was much further than I thought. By the time we parked and got to the parade route, the, all we could do was sit on the curb facing the side street while the parade went this way, <laughs> from the back end. Have you ever watched the parade from the, from the rear end? <laughs> well, we didn't care. We were going to the Rose Bowl. Actually, it was a better view than watching it on black and white TV in Minnesota. Oh, and we were so excited when the Stanford band came by. The Michigan band came by all dressed in their black uniforms neatly pressed and marching in order, playing magnificently, at least it looked and sounded so from the rear end view. <laughs> then came the Stanford band, in their white pants and red sport coats and their ties every direction, straw hats askew, weaving in circles and out of step, but still playing a recognizable tune. 
We laughed until our sides hurt. After the parade and lunch, we drove to the stadium. And we were able to park just a few blocks from the stadium, next to a park in a residential area. We thought Craig and Mother could play in the park. Now you recall, we had three tickets. But of course, they weren't together. <laughs> the one we purchased from the newspaper was nowhere near the two we got through our season tickets. But uh, we didn't care. We were going to the Rose Bowl. I don't remember the rationale, but uh, we decided that the two boys would take turns sitting with me. Tim sat with me the first half, and Jack sat with me the second half. Can you imagine today anyone letting an eight-year-old sit by himself in a crowded football stadium, eight years old? But my boys were not afraid. They knew their social graces. They enjoyed themselves. And after all, they were watching Stanford win the Rose Bowl game, 13 to 12. Yeah. Hmm. Parents. Parents. First principle of child rearing. First most important principle of parenting. Have fun with your kids. Enjoy them. Meanwhile, back at the car. Ellie was a, this is a long story, but it, well, I'll get to the point of it. <laughs> Ellie was unloading the trunk when a lovely black woman came out from her house across the street and asked Ellie if her family were at the uh, game. Ellie said yes. She said, well, come on in and watch, and watch it on TV with us, and your little boy can play with my children. Well, Ellie gladly accepted went in and found out that the woman had been released from the hospital that morning. And here she was, taking in strangers and entertaining them. When Ellie was introduced to the woman's husband, he asked, Do you know Jackie Robinson? Have you heard of Jackie Robinson? Ellie said, Well, of course. He said, Well, I'm Jackie Robinson's older brother. And Ellie watched the Rose Bowl game with Mac Robinson, Jackie Robinson, big brother. And they were such gracious people that when the boys and I returned from the stadium, Mac had us follow his car as he led us through the back streets of Pasadena to avoid all the heavy traffic, get us on the freeway to go home in the fall. <laughs> Aren't people wonderful? Our people great. Underneath, differing exteriors, we're all the same. We're all the same. Regardless of color, sexual orientation, national origin, we're all the same. And when you close the door and isolate yourself to only experience, to only associate with people you think are similar to you, you miss out on some beautiful adventures that are out there waiting for you. Are you in or are you out? Who's in, who's out? In God's family, everyone is in. Thanks to Jesus, Peter, Paul, and Philip, no one is out. In God's family, everyone is in. The only way to be out is to choose Choose to be out. Are you in or are you out? And will you open your arms to welcome?